Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. And this week's pick of the week... The King in Black, number one from Marvel Comics, written by Donny Cates, artwork by Brian Stegman. Of course, I loved this issue. Now, this has been a long time coming. Ever since Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman took over Venom, we have been teased this whole idea that Null is coming. Well, finally, Null has arrived. And let me tell you something. This book doesn't waste any time getting to it. Now that we've waited so long and built up so much anticipation, when it starts, it starts hard, it starts fast, and it starts big. And it's awesome. King of Black number one really lived up, I think, to the hype, at least as an issue number one, launching the series off into some really dire um, circumstances for the Marvel Universe, setting up the level of threat that Null is. There are giant moments in the book that they're, they happen so often, it's like so wild. It's all happening at once. It's excessive at times, and it's so much fun. Ryan Stegman's artwork just shines. There are several double-page spreads in this first issue that are just amazing, fantastic things I could just look at. Great detail, big, powerful characters, epic, um, dire consequences, so much of it in this event mode is captured by the artwork and the coloring, the inking, everything all wrapped together. All in all, I really liked The King in Black. I thought it was a great solid start to this event. Um, I'm judging that the idea that you really just need to read King in Black and maybe the Venom book to get the full on story, all the other stuff, we'll cover it as it comes along, but a lot of it's gonna be not very necessary, but this, felt big, it felt like sudden, and I just love that. I, one of my favorite things about this book is that when it starts, it doesn't waste time. It doesn't just like meander around for a little bit and slowly start building things up. It just starts and it just rolls right on through to the very end and the artwork shines. Stegman, some of his best work to date is in King and Black number one. I loved it. Pick of the Week from Marvel Comics. Let's continue on with The Union, number one, first issue of a new miniseries. It's written by Paul Greist, um, De uh, DeVito on the artwork. Um, this one is pretty decent. I think DeVito might be a co-writer. Maybe he's the artist. Now I'm going to have to look it up and waste precious time. Yeah, DeVito is the artist with Greist as well. Anyway, um, or is it Grist? Anyway, The Union is a superhero team of UK heroes. So you got one from Scotland, one from Wales, one from Northern Ireland, one from England, right? And then Union Jack's there just to kind of tie it all together. Because I guess he's the most familiar, at least to me, of all these UK heroes. So this is its own book. It's a King and Black tie-in because it does have an appearance from something in King and Black. And, and it makes sense after, especially after you've read King and Black. But Outside of that, like, that's all it is. It's a very small tie-in, nothing story essential. But the story itself was actually very well done. So the UK, they're trying to put together this team that's representative of all the, the nations in the UK. And and it's kind of got this quirky sense of humor to it. Union Jack's in it, and I really like that character. Um, and he doesn't really get a big spotlight at times. So I liked it. I thought it had a great sense of humor and, and fun about it. The tie-in to King and Black, it could have been anything else. It didn't mean, it didn't have to be King and Black. But I thought it was actually a pretty solid book. And there's some of these characters that I'm not familiar with. I don't know if they're new or if they've existed in books that I just didn't know. Um, but I'm really interested in finding out more about that. So I actually was going, I was planning on sleeping on this book, but I actually enjoyed it, so there you go. Thor number 10 is out, as if King in Black number one wasn't enough, Donny Cates and Marvel also gives a Thor number 10 with Nick Klein on the artwork, Matt Wilson on the coloring. Um, this was a great issue. So after the revelations of the last issue, basically Donald Blake has escaped back into the Marvel reality and he's pissed, he's not happy, and he's kind of taking this like crazy villainous turn and 
this the turn continues in Thor number ten, and and I loved every moment of this. Uh, the narration by Donny Cates um, was really great. The way he tells the story, the way he builds up the feelings of Donald Blake and this pent up frustration and everything that's happened to him, and then the way it breaks down into the other characters, and he's basically him just kind of tearing ass through Asgard, and then. It has an ending that's like, ooh, I'm really liking this story. At first, you know, in the last issue, I was like, that's a really cool twist. But now I'm really, like, just just loving this Thor issue right here. Thor number 10 was really, really strong, and I had a lot of fun with this one. I think Donny Cates is doing something really cool. And Klein and Wilson's uh, coloring and the artwork, fantastic, fantastic. We had Daredevil number 25. Chip Zdarsky continuing writing one of the best Marvel comic books on shelves. Um, so this is a really good week for Marvel, um, honestly. Daredevil number 25, um, Chip Zdarsky. Marco Cicchetto is back, so that means it's probably going to be more of an up issue, and it is. So after the craziness of the last couple issues, Daredevil's in prison right there on the cover. And there are <clears throat> some turns of events in this issue that I think have a lot of people going a little crazy. Um, I'm already hearing some rumblings about it. I think the reaction's not, I mean, it's some really cool stuff that happens here at the end of this book, and I'm really excited to see where it goes, and without really getting into it or spoiling it, I don't think it's honestly that big of a deal, but it is going to be really fun to see it explored. But Chichetto back on the artwork, it shines, it's great, and I'm really digging it. But I was wondering, I was like, is Daredevil going to be in prison, like in a prison uniform, but with a Daredevil mask on? Yes. Yes, I love that Sidarsky embraces that silliness. Speaking of embracing silliness, we have Modoc Head Games number one. This book is freaking cool. I really like this one. So it's written by Justin Bloom, uh, Blum, and Patton Oswalt. So that's really really cool. Um, the artwork is done by Scott Hepburn. This book doesn't take itself too seriously. Um, it's got a fun sense of humor to it and quirkiness, as it should. It's about MODOK. Now, MODOK could be sinister, um, and he's he's definitely portrayed sinister. He doesn't... this they What Oswald and, and Blum do, do in here is they don't betray the character of MODOK, but they're able to tell this rather witty and out there and preposterous story, um, but actually have it stay true to the nature and character of MODOK and actually paint him a little bit um, as a relatable type character. So I thought this book was rather charming and really fun and silly, but at the same time, it, it had some seriousness to it, but it didn't handle it in a way that was overwrought or anything like that. I actually really liked MODOK Head Games. Patton Oswalt, I believe, is doing the MODOK animated show coming up on Disney+, Plus, going to be voicing the character. I've always been obsessed with MODOK ever since I was read what was the Superium Stratagem or whatever in the uh, Grunewald Captain America stuff. I read that when I was a kid, and then I had a, a MODOK action figure from the Iron Man Toy Biz line. That was fantastic. That was, that was really fun. MODOK fans, rejoice. That's going to be a fun miniseries. Hellions number seven is here. The first post-ten of Swords books. I guess now technically we're in the Reign of X, right? Or this is still kind of an in-between type story. This is kind of picking up off of Ten of Swords where the Hellions went there. They kind of got all wiped out. Sinister came back alone. And this is picking up from there and moving forward. Um, you got some... I don't want to spoil anything, but there's some reinterpretations of some characters in this issue that I thought were pretty B.A., pretty awesome. Um, but Hellions continues to have a nice flow about it, a nice, free, fun, and loose style. Um, Sinister is painted, um, obviously not a good guy, but in a very humorous light, but it's not over-the-top, dumb, cheesy. It still stays true to the character, it feels like. At least in Hellions, there's some interesting developments, though, in number seven. And I really liked it. I thought it was super solid. I was wondering, what's Hellions going to do now? And and this. And focusing on Sinister and his plans, his manipulations, that's going to be dope. X-Factor number five is here. I'm not sold on this book, so I wasn't sold so much on the first arc, and then the Ten of Swords tie-in was okay, and then this one gets back to what Leah Williams and company are trying to set forth as the identity of the book. Um, the fact that X-Factor investigates the deaths of mutants to make sure that they're actually dead and what exactly happened, and then they go through with Resurrection Protocol. Both of these books are dealing with the after effects of the Resurrection Protocol stuff. When the mutants found out that if one of them dies in Otherworld, 
they don't come back right. And so this explores some of the rock slide stuff. That explores some of the stuff of the Hellions who died in Araco. Or in, uh, were they in Amoth? I think they were in Amoth. What are they? I don't know. Anyway, X Factor number five deals a little bit with the rock slide stuff, and I think that's really cool. But aside from that, I'm just not really digging the team dynamic. I feel the book has its identity, but it's just not quite fitting for me. And this may be one of the first X books that I just kind of silently drop off of. We shall see. Fantastic Four Road Trip number one. This is a one-shot comic book. It's written by Christopher Cantwell, I am pretty sure. Yeah, uh, Felipe Andrade on the art and Chris O'Halloran doing the coloring. Um, this is a really interesting one-shot for the Fantastic Four. So it's a road trip, right? And then it gets into this weird, like, almost old-school sci-fi, almost Cronenberg body horror type stuff involving the Fantastic Four and a crazy... Uh, plot and threat from a classic villain. I rather enjoy this. The artwork is not what you're going to expect from your typical Marvel comic book for sure, but for me, I really freaking liked the artwork and I thought it really fit the tone and the pace and the flow and the atmosphere of the story. I really like this one. It delved a little bit into body horror. It doesn't go too far. It still has this silly kind of flair uh, this fun bounce throughout it. But all in all, I thought a pretty solidly well done Fantastic Four one shot that was trying to do something a little bit different. When you, you're only getting a one shot, you're not going to get to change the worlds of the Fantastic Four. Um, but still, some interesting stuff. I liked it. I liked that. I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, Black Widow number four is out from Kelly Thompson and. Who is the artist? Casa Grande. Alina Casa Grande. Um, I'm really becoming a fan of Black Widow now. Kelly Thompson, to me, is bringing that action and that excitement that she had in her Hawkeye run into Black Widow, but it feels a little bit more grown up, a little bit more... Uh, sleek and sophisticated is the wrong word, because I really think that Hawkeye book, especially with Romero and Belair on the artwork, but you got Belair back here, right? Yeah, Belair back here on the, uh, the coloring. Um, the artwork is great. It's got... I guess it's just more of an action movie flair to it. That's what I should say. It's it's actually a little bit more... It's definitely more like an action movie, and I'm, I'm really liking this. So Natasha has been kidnapped, and now she's been leading this life. She's got a kid and a husband. She doesn't remember who she is, and now the tables are turning back around. We're finding out more about what's actually been going on. Um, the action scenes in here are very well done. The artwork, the pacing, the, the, the pacing through the script and through the artwork... This is a really well-done comic book, and I'm really excited because Kelly Thompson's run on Captain Marvel, for me, has been kind of okay. But this, four issues in, I'm getting more and more sold each issue, and that's how I was feeling about that Hawkeye run. So this was really solid stuff. Black Widow, number four. Very pleased with that. Miles Morales, number 21. It's Miles Morales, Spider-Man, number 21. So this is wrapping up the whole Ultimatum saga, they're, they're calling it, which... They spent a lot of time building this thing up, and then at, at the end, it feels kind of almost like it was a breezed and rushed ending. Though there are big, impactful things to the live, to the life of Miles that happen in this issue, it felt like it was a bit rushed. Maybe it was just my current zone when I was reading the issue. Maybe it will read better all together in a collected edition. But for me, this ending just kind of felt a bit rushed, and there were some big moments that I felt were robbed of their weight because of that. But maybe that was, there was just something about it. The artwork maybe felt a bit too frantic. The artwork never allowed the space for certain moments to, to breathe and be open. I don't know. But it was an okay conclusion to the Ultimatum Saga. But it does have some big time moments for Miles in here. And Miles Morales, Spider-Man number 21. We have another one of the Marvel's snapshots. This is Civil War. So this one's solid in Ahmed, who writes... Uh, Miles Morales there. And Ryan Kelly on the artwork. Artwork's decent. Kind of got an old school, kind of Jerry Ordway almost type flair. Um, not quite as refined as Ordway, a little bit looser. Um, but still, um, I like this one. I thought it was cool. This is focusing on uh, a kid with superhero powers during the time of the Civil War. N not the... Not the American Civil War, but the Marvel Civil War um, with the Superhero Registration Act. And, it, and it's about this guy who signs up because he feels like, oh, yes, that's great. So he signs up for S.H.I.E.L.D. And, and it's just this story about the S.H.I.E.L.D. agent and this kid with powers in the midst of all of the superhero registration trying to show you the ground level effect 
of the superhero registration Civil War type stuff, which they've done before, but they're doing it in that Marvel's flair. And I thought, especially after the last few of these have been a little bit mm, for me, this was a nice return to those first couple, like the Namor and the Fantastic Four. I thought this one was pretty solid. I liked it. I rather liked it. Let's jump over to DC, where we have Batman Catwoman number one from Tom King and Clay Mann. So this is kind of like... So we know that Tom King's run got cut short on Batman. He still had a, several issues he wanted to do. That's apparently going to be done in this, I think, 12-issue series. Maybe it's less. Maybe... I think it's 12, though. Um, and it's DC Black Label, which means it's not necessarily tied into continuity. But... This is basically the coda to Tom King's Batman run, but with, I guess, less editorial restraint, probably. Um, this was a pretty decent issue, though. So regardless of what you think about the Tom King run on Batman, and this definitely is dealing with certain elements of that, mostly the romance between Bruce and Selina, um, which I thought was handled very well in here. Um, so it's picking up on some of those themes, but even if you didn't really like that or didn't even read that, Maybe you might want to check this one out, um, but it picks up a lot on those, especially that annual issue where it shows that Bruce had died from cancer and that Selena had grown, that him and Selena had grown old and he had died from cancer and they had a daughter, Helena, right? And all that stuff is referenced in here. Plus there's like a present day story, plus there's like a past story. So they're doing all these kind of things and they're introducing the idea and concept of the phantasm into Batman comic books, like, you know, Mask of the Phantasm. And the way they handle that's interesting, and they do it with an even darker twist. Um, so this was a book that, as I was reading it, I felt it was being it was disjointed and a bit just jarring. But when I got to the end, I saw how everything came together, and I really thought it was a pretty strong first issue of Batman Catwoman number one. And I'm really, really excited with the way that he's building up this phantasm stuff, Tom King and Clay Man, and the artwork's pretty dope. Pretty dope, too, if not thirsty at, at many times. But Batman Catwoman number one, pretty solid. I liked it. Batman 104 by James Tynion and uh, Gillian March and Benjamin. Yeah, the, the artwork's okay in this one. It's an okay issue. I like the character, the, the ghost maker or whatever. It's kind of like this take. It's a different take on Bruce, on his mission. Um, so it's okay. I just think that this post-Joker War Tinian story is just okay. Like, I'm not, it's not bad, but it's not super great. And I think a big thing of that is Jorge Jimenez's absence on the artwork. I'm very excited to get him back. I'm sure he's coming back soon, probably post-Future State. Um, but it's a decent story. It's a decent character, albeit some things like this have been done. A guy, a mysterious person from Bruce's past that he, you know, during his training days and now he's back and nobody knows about it. Bruce always keeps secrets and things like that. Though there is some nice stuff digging into Robin's history here. And if you start noticing, when they start referencing the past, they're wearing their like classic costumes, for instance. In this issue, Robin's talking about this story and they flash back and he's wearing the little pixie boots and the little shorts. So that's an interesting development, I guess, you know, leading into the whole death metal finales or whatever. But it was okay. Batman's been okay. It's been solid. You just know that Tinyan was only meant to do the Joker War and then nothing after that. And then now he's been asked to continue, so it just feels like this was kind of the first idea that came to his mind. Batman The Adventures Continue, number seven. But what I'm saying is, I still feel like this book has is building up to something, though. Definitely, right? Batman The Adventures Continue, number seven. This is wrapping up that whole Red Hood story in the animated universe, um, and a very well done conclusion. I've been enjoying this. If you were a fan of the animated series, I think you'll like it. Paul Dini, Alan Burnett. I do believe the series is continuing on. I, I I don't know. Every time I look it up, it always says like, oh, it's six issues. No, it's seven. Oh, it's eight. So I this book, keep buying it. They're going to keep making it. I bet. Um, if it's digital first, so those issues should already be out. Anyway, great cover there, isn't it? Batman the Avengers continue number seven. I'm rambling. That was pretty solid. I liked it. Justice League, Endless Winter number one. So I'm not looking forward to this Justice League thing. It's basically throughout the month of December. A lot of DC books are going to be tied into this Endless Winter thing. It's just like a one and done story by Ron Mars and Dan Abnett. And that's cool. I like, I like and respect their work. So let's check it out. Howard Porter's on the artwork. Sure, right? Great cover by Francis Monopole there. No. No, that's, uh, that's Mick, uh, Michael Hanen or whatever, right? Um, anyway... Uh, I really liked this one. I thought it was super solid. Like, if you were watching 
um, a three-part arc on Justice League, and this was like the first bit of episode one, you'd be like, okay, I'm cool. I'm going to watch this episode of Justice League. So it was cool. Introduces a new villain in a really cool, interesting way. I like that friendly dynamic between the Justice League. It works. It fits. It, it just seems fine. It's, it's average though. It's nothing super great, but it's not bad in the slightest. It's pretty solid. And if you just want to jump into a fresh, new Justice League story with all your favorite characters and a new villain and a big time threat. Just jump into this. It's going to go through Flash. Aquaman is going to have a Black Adam uh, special. There's some interesting tie-ins to Black Adam's history here. So that's going to be cool uh, to see that get explored. So it's going to have a few one-shot tie-ins. It's going to tie into some of these other issues. Justice League Dark is one. Um, but this is going to be a crossover that runs through December. But the first issue, at least, was actually pretty solid. We got a new Tales from the Dark Multiverse. This time it's Wonder Woman War of the Gods taking on that classic 80s story, right? Late 80s, early 90s, it's late 80s, right? That's from the George Perez stuff, right? Um, Vita Ayala, um, Ariel Olivetti. Um, this one's okay. I don't have that big of a connection to this original story, but this is mostly about a Wonder Woman who actually gets, during at the end of War of Gods, she defeats uh, Hecate, and in this one, she gets possessed by her and taken over. And so she just starts, like, de demolishing things. These basically read, like, um, what-ifs over at DC. Like, DC versions of Marvel what-if. And they're pretty fun because they're dark, twisted takes on classic stories. So if you really like Wonder Woman, if you really like the War of the Gods, the George Perez stuff, if you really want to see a darker, crazier, alternate version of that, or if you've just been digging this multiverse stuff, definitely check it out. But... It was okay. It was not one of the strongest ones. Deceased Dead Planet number six is here, the penultimate issue of Deceased Dead Planet. Um, Tom Taylor's doing some really great stuff with this. It could just easily be a throwaway alternate universe story that doesn't ever have any kind of emotional or tonal resonance or anything like that, but it does. But then you got great, brilliant things being done with the story structure. There are seeds that were laid throughout bits of this book that now everything has come together. And this book has almost been deceived us in the way that it's structured with relying so much lately you're like oh Constantine that's the big deal but there's other big deals and everything is building up and then it builds up into one crazy cool thing and I really like Tom Taylor's approach to these heroes to the legacy vibe of it to the level of threat and to making it still feel significant even though this is ultimately you strip everything out and it's a story we've seen tons of times that we've read over and over again but with what tom taylor and trevor Herzine bring in it just this is such a fun book because it also does it also does have that like i said emotional and tonal resonance metal men is here with its final issue issue number 12 you know, I'm glad I stuck through and read all of the Metal Men. This was a decent, fun story. Um, it had some cool, interesting ideas. It has a nice, satisfying conclusion here. And since Dan DiDio is the writer of this book, um, and it's been coming out and been worked on and in production since he's been fired, he actually kind of gets to make a really nice kind of final statement in the pages of Metal Men number 12 that I thought was, was very nice, actually. But Metal Men overall... It's a silly story. It was decent. It had some cool, interesting parts. It had a new villain, the Plutonium Man, who looked just like Carnage, but he was pink. Um, but overall, I thought it was okay. But I'm not telling you, like, don't, you know, it's not like, get to go run out and get Metal Men. It's going to turn you into a Metal Men fan. But it was solid. It was okay. It was a fun read. Strange Adventures number seven is here from Tom King, Mitch Gerrards, and Doc Shaner. Um, I really like Strange Adventures, and I really have been liking the turns taken in the last few issues, and issue number seven is really cool. So we were promised that Tom King is exploring the idea of what it means to be a science fiction war hero. They're starting to reveal more about Adam Strange, about his past, about what happened in that war on Ran, and how that's influencing everything that's going on in the current day. And the way that the two different art styles are there, they complement each other. They're two completely different styles, but they flow so well together. And Shaner has some incredibly awesome psychedelic bits in here. I'm loving Strange Adventures number seven. I think it's a great exploration on the character. It's DC Black Label, so it's not necessarily tied into continuity. And I just think it's a really interesting take on a character like Adam Strange and doing it in a very innovative and uh, structurally innovative type way. Uh, Strange Adventures number seven. There you go. We also now have the Dreaming Waking Hours number five. Um, this is the final bit of the first arc 
of the Dreaming Waking Hours, and I've really liked this story. I thought the Simon Spurrier run was great, so I wanted to jump in on this one. You got G. Willow Wilson, Nick Ropels, Matt Lopez. The artwork is great. At times, though, it doesn't feel as intricate as it was quite in the beginning, but then it starts getting that feel back into this story. Um, I like the conclusion. I like it. I think it's super satisfying. It sets up a lot to come, and I'm really excited to see this one continue on and see what's coming ahead in the world of the Dreaming. I just thought this was very well done, and I liked all the Shakespearean stuff. I thought it was really good, and I digged it. Let's get into the indies. From Aftershock, we have Knock 'em Dead, number one, written by Elliot Ray Hall, with artwork by Mattia Monaco. I really liked this book. I thought it was super strong. This is about a comedian, or it's about a dude who wants to be a stand-up comedian, and he starts going to, like, open mic nights and stuff like that, and he's just not very good. Right? But the way that the comic book is crafted, between the writing, between the artwork, um, the way it all works together, it tells the story in a very cool way um, and in a very humorous way at times. And then it gets to the point where the comedian literally is dying on stage and there's a big twist and then it sets up what's to come in the future issues. I'm a big fan of Elliot Rahal's work, so I definitely had to check this one out. Plus, did you know that Knock 'em Dead number one is the one that Bueller did his first official comics with Bueller variant for? That's awesome. Station for that. But Knock 'em Dead number one was a really solid read with a great premise and a great setup for what's to come. I thought it was awesome. Erratic number one comes from AWA Upshot. This one's written, written and illustrated and created by Care Andrews. So this is set in the world of the Resistance, I'm guessing, because at one point they call this guy the uh, the Reborn. So it's a superhero. He's a kid. He's like a teenager. And so it deals a lot with like high school stuff. Um, and But he's got powers. He's got interesting powers. He gets these crazy powers for like 10 minutes. So he only has powers for like 10 minutes, 10 minutes a day or something. It's kind of like instead of Our Man, 10 Minute Kids, something like that. Um, they're not, they don't quite get into all of that yet. It's a little bit mysterious. But this issue is mostly set up on this, uh, this kid, um, his family, um, his setting, where he's at. He's in a new place. The way the characters around him are built around, um, like his family, his mother, his brother, um, the relationships there, the way that um, all the stuff going on at school, the way those characters are introduced, it's actually very well crafted and the artwork's pretty cool. Carrie Andrews does some really interesting techniques with his artwork, so I thought that he uh, added that element into Erratic Number 1. A pretty decent debut of an independent superhero, albeit set in the world of the Resistance, but it doesn't lean heavy into that or anything. It's just an excuse for this person to just have powers, right? Anyway, Erratic Number 1. Pretty decent. I thought that was a good, solid number one superhero book. Is that the first superhero book from AWA, right? Firepower number six is here from Robert Kirkman, Chris Samney, Matt Wilson, and Image Comics. Firepower number six was a really solid issue with lots of action, with lots of revelation, but still lots of, as every question is answered, more questions arise. In typical comic book fashion, each one leads into the other, and it's just very incredibly well-crafted. I think Robert Kirkman is doing an amazing job crafting a story that's not overly verbose, not just a bunch of talking heads, but it's got tons of threads of action throughout it that I think Matt Wilson and Chris Samney handle better than most people in comic books. Firepower number six has some really interesting turn of, uh, turns of events. If you've been into the series, all in all, super solid read. That Texas Blood is here with issue number six wrapping up its first story arc. It's going to be taking a little bit of a hiatus, but it will be returning at some point. Um, it, it's, an, it's an interesting conclusion. That Texas Blood is something that tonally kind of lost me along the way because it feels like it was trying to do one thing and then another thing and then settled on something else. With seeing how this all evened out in issue number six, I am definitely looking forward to sitting down and reading all six issues and judging it as a graphic novel. That being said, I still love the artwork, the dialogue spot on, the characters. A lot of them resonate, and with just a little, they can do so much. And that's a credit to the work of Chris Condon and Jacob Phillips. I just, I need to sit down and read this all at once to really fully uh, appreciate and judge it, I think. That Texas Blood number six, though, is here with its final issue of the first arc. Unearth number eight is here. 
It's been forever since the last issue of Unearth, and there was a long time between that issue and the issue before it. So every time I read Unearth, I read the recap page, I try to get right back into it, and then I start feeling lost. But there's still some cool ideas and interesting artwork that keeps me, you know, appealed, you know, or compelled, I should say, throughout the reading process. But all in all, Unearth number eight to me just... I'm, I'm feeling lost. I think maybe a reread or maybe just a trade weight or something if it's going to have this long of a wait between issues. But Unearth number eight was was okay. It's got some interesting ideas and concepts. It's got some great artwork, but I've, I'm feeling disconnected from the story. Heavy number three from Vault Comics. This one's written by Max Bemis. Um, I really liked issue number one and two, though it's a little bit quirky. It's not going to be to everybody's taste. Issue three for me got a little... I don't know, it's kind of spent too much time on just the one idea about a character trying to flesh this out. Mostly his relationship with his wife who was killed um, and now he's partnered up with the dude who like ruined her life. It's it's a really interesting dynamic there. Um, it has a lot of fun with the, the story, with the structure, with the artwork, with the composition. So I like the flow of the book. I like the vibe of the book. But issue three to me just felt a bit too heavy for heavy. Um, but I thought it was okay but not as exciting as issue one or two. Um, but it still has some wild stuff in it, really did. Hellboy and the BPRD, Her Fatal Hour and The Sending. This is just one of those nice, delightful, one-shot Hell Hellboy stories that you could read, even if you've never read a comic book of Hellboy, you could just pick this up and read it, and this gives you a lot of that tone of what that typical Hellboy Magnola atmosphere is and I just loved it. Her Fatal Hour and The Sinning, one full-size story, one shorter story. I love when Mignola does these things. The artist is Turnin Travlion. I probably totally butchered that name but the artwork is super super solid. The composition and panel design and layout is all there. It's totally Mignola and it's just a great one and done Hellboy story or should I say two and done. Anyway, I thought it was super solid. We also have the final issue of Spy Island from Dark Horse Comics by Island Number 4 by Chelsea Kane and Company. Love that cover, by the way. I, VHS. I used to have tons of them. Um, Spy Island is an interesting exploration in technique, um, but it failed ever to really deliver me a compelling story or compelling characters. And But there is something to be applauded about the technique being used to make Spy Island. So it's definitely something that's worth looking at, but it's not something to me that really grabbed me on a way that most story does, which is through story concept and characters. Um, so Spy Island, though, has some really interesting techniques and ways to tell the story. And it's something that Kane and company have already started working and developing in Maneaters. And so that's some interesting stuff. I think a lot of some things could be ironed out, but I think I think give it another go because it's an interesting technique to tell comics. Anyway, that's what I read and that's what I thought about it. What are you reading? What are you digging? What are you thinking about it? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching the video. Please do like, share, and subscribe. And join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.